today, uh, digging deeper, mining in Colombia and the urgent need for a UN binding treaty. Um, before we start, uh, we might just go through a few technical details. We have the uh, translation in uh, Spanish and English. So if you need translation, uh, please go to the bottom of your screen and click the, the language you require. Can someone maybe um, intervene in Spanish? Thank you. So just before starting, we just want to talk about a few technical details for interpreting. If you need interpreting, we have it's Spanish and English interpreting and you can look for the icon. There's a little globe at the bottom and and you can uh, choose the channel that you'd require or on Facebook live. You have it in uh, you have it in Spanish. Thank you, Luisa. Um, just to note, uh, as we go through the session, after our panelists speak, we'll have a section for questions and answers. So if you have questions as you go along, please put them in the Q&A session at the bottom of your screen. Um, also, throughout the, the webinar, we hope that um, you can take solidarity actions with us. Um, so there are a few different actions you can take um, in the context of uh, targeting Colombian decision makers, but also uh, Irish decision makers and UK decision makers. Um, so these will go in the chat and um, you'll see these, there's um, opportunities to tweet and retweet um, and we, we'll, we'll uh, refer to them at the end of the session as well. Um, and just for information, the event is also being transmitted online on the Facebook page, uh, La Guajira Abla. Um, so to introduce myself, my name is Siobhan Curran um, and I'm the policy advisor with TROCRA and I will moderate the session today. Um, the session has been jointly organised by CAFOD, the Catholic Agency for Overseas Development in England and Wales, TROCRA, uh, Christian Aid Ireland, SINEP, the Centre for Research and Popular Education Peace Programme in Colombia and AB Colombia. Um, and the event, as you know, is a side uh, a side event to the the open in, the intergovernmental working group session to uh, elaborate a binding treaty to regulate transnational corporations and other business enterprises. And this session is taking place this week. Uh, we're midway through the session now, and of course, we'll talk about the UN treaty. Uh, today and how that relates to Colombia. Um, but the, the event is also taking place as part of the Month of Solidarity Against Social and Environmental Impunity in La Guajira, promoted by local communities, SINEP and other Colombian organisations. And so the theme of today's seminar is really about holding transnational corporations to account for human rights abuses, for um, environmental harm and for corporate misconduct in the global south. Um, and to give a small bit of context for the discussions today, the speakers will be discussing the impacts of the El Cerrojan mine, which has been operating in La Guajira in Colombia for decades. It's one of the world's largest open pit mines and it's jointly owned by the subsidiaries of multinational mining companies who are listed on the London Stock Exchange. So these are BHB, uh, Anglo-American and Glencore. Uh, in addition, for 20 years, the Electricity Supply Board in Ireland has purchased coal from this mine. Um, and in Colombia, there have been a number of important court rulings against Sarah Hahn um, to protect communities, um, which the speakers will address. Um, but I suppose to say there's been a lack of compliance with these by both the, the companies and the, the Colombian authorities. And so today we really will want to discuss the impact of the, um, the mining in La Guajira, the lack of compliance with court ruling, rulings, and how this relates to the need for global rules and a UN binding treaty to regulate corporations. So I'm delighted to, to introduce an excellent panel of speakers today. Um, firstly, we will have a video input from David Boyd, the UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights in the Environment, who in September of this year called for Colombia to suspend some operations at the Sarah Hahn mine. And we're um, delighted that he took the time to do a video input for us. This will be followed um, 
uh, by an input from Monica Lopez Pushaina from the Wayu Indigenous Peoples in uh, La Gran Parada community, La Guajira, Colombia. And, and we're privileged to have uh, Monica here with us today. Thank you. Um, this will then be followed by an input from Luisa Rodriguez Fernandez from Colombian Jesuit organization SINUP and Connor O'Neill from Christian Aid Ireland. And both organizations have been working with local communities in La Guajira, impacted by the, the Sarahan operations. And, and again, delighted uh, for such an excellent panel. Um, so with, without any further ado, um, we might uh, firstly hear the video input from the UN Special Rapporteur, David Boyd. Hello from Canada. I'm Dr. David Boyd, the United Nations Special Rapporteur on Human Rights and the Environment. I'm really thankful for the invitation to join you and uh, for this important event marking the sixth session of the open-ended intergovernmental working group on transnational corporations. I must say that as a Canadian, I'm painfully familiar with the fact that mining companies, many of whom are headquartered here in Canada, are guilty of not protecting the environment, not respecting people's human rights. And certainly Canadian mining companies have been operating with relative impunity in Latin America, Africa, and other regions for far too long. But I'm here today to discuss the situation in Colombia uh, involving the El Cerrejon open pit coal mine. Now, Colombia, as many of you will know, is an absolutely beautiful country one of the world's most mega diverse countries in terms of the biodiversity, the flora and fauna that it is home to. However, oh, and I should also add that Colombia has a terrific constitution, one of the world's leading ecological constitutions. Colombia also has relatively strong environmental laws and policies, at least on paper, but there is a huge implementation and enforcement gap, as is true in so many countries. The situation that was brought to my attention recently regarding the El Cerrejon mine and the Wayu indigenous people is one of the most disturbing situations that I've learned about in my two and a half years as the special rapporteur on human rights and the environment. The Wayu indigenous people live directly adjacent to the El Cerrejon mine, which is one of the world's largest coal mines. And they have been suffering for years from chronic air pollution, water pollution, diversion of their water supply, uh, dust falling on their croplands, making agriculture impossible, noise, vibrations, disruptions, uh, a total calamity in terms of their quality of life and their human rights, their rights to water, to food, to health, to life, and the right to live in a healthy environment, a right which is protected by the Colombian constitution. The YU people, some of their leaders, have brought cases to courts. Most recently, a, a very compelling decision of the Constitutional Court of Colombia, which found that the mine was generating pollution and having devastating impacts on the health of the YU people. Impacts including adverse respiratory diseases, uh, poor uh, impacts on their hearts, cancer, and a whole litany of horrific heart, uh, health conditions. So this leads me to ask, what on earth could allow such a situation to persist? A multi-billion dollar coal mine right adjacent to, right beside an indigenous community living in extreme poverty. This is an absolutely compelling example of why decades of corporate social responsibility have completely failed the world and the vulnerable people of the world. And that is why the world so desperately needs a new binding treaty to regulate the behavior of transnational corporations, a treaty with teeth, a treaty that establishes mechanisms where people can register complaints that their rights are being violated and ensure that they get compensation or reparations when those rights have been violated. So uh, I want to thank the organizers of this event for the work that they are doing to protect vulnerable people and this beautiful 
but somewhat beleaguered blue-green planet, which we are all so fortunate to call home. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias. I've just given time for the, trans, the, the Spanish translation to finish. Um, so for, for those who have just joined, uh, that was the UN Special Rapporteur, uh, David Boyd, um, who really, I think, has given us such a powerful message and a message I think that all the member states need to hear, uh, particularly that decades of, CS failed, of CSOR have failed and we need a UN treaty with teeth and I think that's an important message for this week. Um, so we will now uh, move to our next speaker, who is Monica Lopez Pushaina from the community of La Gran Parada and from the Wayu Indigenous Peoples uh, in La Guajira to hear directly about the impact of the mining in La Guajira. Monica is working to defend her community's human rights, their water, the environment, and spiritual and cultural survival. Um, thank you so much for being here with us today, Monica, and I'll hand over to you. Thank you. Can you hear me? Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome here from the Wayu people of Wajira. First of all, I want to thank you very much for offering us this opportunity to uh, cast light on all of the situations that we are facing in our territory. Monica Lopez of China is my name. I'm a female Wahoo, Waiju, defender of human rights and water, and I come from the community of La Providencia. Um, I'm going to talk to you about some of the things that show, that illustrate all of the um, all of the problems that we have faced as a department as a result of um, the exploitation of coal in the department of Guajira. They are, it has caused untold damage to our land of the Guajira. This is a land which is sacred to us um, and which the Cerejon company we call the land Serajon, and this was a, a name that the mining company stole from us. They now call it Serajon Limited. It was our name, but they have um, privatized the, the name to our territory, seized control of our own name. And this has all been done in the name of the, the wrongly denominated progress, so-called progress. They arrived in our territory making promises to us. And that's how uh, all the damage that today we are suffering began. They came saying that they were going to make bring progress to our land. As I've said, the, as I said, in the name of development, that's what they said. For us, that means desarrollo, which is the destruction of the arroyos, which means water surface sources. So it's a, a play on words, undevelopment under development caused by the drying of our rivers. We are suffering the enormous consequences of the activities of the mining company. For instance, we've got severe um, health um, consequences. We have um, rashes and problems with our skin. Um, we've got respiratory problems, hearing problems, gastrointestinal problems, all of these were things which were unknown before the arrival of the mine. And this is all the result of the effects of the mining act of the activities of the mining companies. Pollution. They have contaminated all of our water sources, which are the only sources of water that we have in order to, to survive, to drink and to wash and for our, our clothes and ourselves, and also for the animals. All of our water sources have been contaminated. And all of this is the result of these uh, activities that they have come, that they have, um, that they're carrying out in our territory, supposedly to bring development. So we're talking here about the river called the Bruno, which is our local water source, has been entirely contaminated by their mining activities. More than 19 
um, watercourses have disappeared completely, have dried up completely. And this is what they call development. Development in that case means the destruction of our people, the destruction of our territory. And when they end, when they destroy these water sources, it means that they're also destroying us. They're destroying our spirituality. They're destroying the, the people that um, our um, sacred beings who protect us. They're, they are destroying our gods who protect the water sources. They're destroying our culture because we without water can't live. And so just as the multinational company doesn't doesn't produce anything that is um, of benefit to us. All it's bringing to us is losses. The profits that they make are not arriving in our hands. We're losing our human rights. Our human rights are being violated in the territory. And we've also had such serious effects. Another major effect is, our, is the cultural damage that is being called. We didn't know what militarization was before the mine arrived, and now our territory is entirely militarized. Today, nowadays, we have to live hand by hand with troops. We live in a militarized society with the presence of legal and illegal armed groups in our territory. We didn't even know those existed before the mine arrived in our territory. I think it has had a, so the arrival of the mine has had a tremendous effect on our territory because today we're now experiencing drug addiction among our young people. We're now seeing prostitution in our communities. Now the right to, the right to private life, to a private life of our women and of our sacred places have been, are being violated as well. The place called Los Molinos, Los Aguayes, which is where we used to have um, carry out our rituals as a community. We're no longer able to go to those places because they're occupied by the military. Because the military, the soldiers have arrived and are now occupy our sacred spaces. They um, exercise control, protection as they call it, of the 150,000 square kilometers um, of, of land that used to be ours. And today we are paying the consequences of this presence because these 150 square kilometers is now um, under the hands of the of the military. We have to be we have to pass through military checkpoints and explain ourselves to the military every day in every square centimeter of our territory. This is our daily life now. They've also uh, the and. And we are, they're limiting our freedom of movement. This was something which we didn't have any understanding of before either. This is our territory. In the old days before the mine arrived, we could go wherever we wanted, whenever we wanted. So this is one of the effects that the mine, um, that the, so this has led also the mining activities or the presence of the mine has led to the div divisions in our communities. We used to live in, in harmony and, and in peaceful coexistence, and that no longer is the case. They've brought division. They've co-opted, the mining companies have co-opted co our leaders, certain of our leaders. They've co-opted local officials. This is following the, um, in response to the strategy that the mine has to pay people off, to offer money so that, so that um, self-proclaimed or, or leaders proclaimed by the company themselves accept the plans of the mining company going behind the backs and against the interests of the of the state so their strategy is to divide the communities to divide their um, to divide our organizations and this strategy that they follow to offer money in order to pay off just to pay off a few to serve their interests is taken at the expense of the community. This has also resulted in our, in our being displaced. There are communities that have disappeared. There are communities that have, that have disappeared completely, that have been displaced complete, completely like Rezavaco and other black communities. 
our um, communities such as El Caracolí, El Espinal, which were Waiju communities, have been displaced. People have been forced out of them. People have had to, the inhabitants have had to abandon these places where they were born and where they grew up, where our grandparents, where our, where our ancestors are, are buried. We were forced off these territories. We were forced out of them um, because the, the mine had to expand and we've been relocated to sterile communities that are distant from all of the traditions that we used to maintain in our settlements. I also wanted to emphasize that this month is the month against impunity here in, in Guajira. We are demanding that there should be no more impunity, that there should be no more, that the company, um, that the Serajon company should no longer ignore the com commitments it has made or the order, the judicial orders that it has been told that it has to implement. These, these legal rulings, the rulings of the court in favor of the community are being ignored by the, by the company. These are legal um, decisions that have been made in favor of our, of our children, in favor of life. These are being systematically ignored by the, by the company. And this month against impunity is demanding that the company responds positively to them, that they protect our water, that they recuperate our water sources. All of these decisions have been ignored by the, by the company. This is why it's so important for us for the us as a community, that all other countries support the principle of a binding treaty. Um, human rights are important for us, and it's important therefore that we get as much support as we can in favor of a binding treaty so that our territory, so that our rights um, are, are respected and protected. This international support that we, we, that we require um, is very, very important. I'd like to thank the Special Rapporteur of the UN for, for his position, for supporting us as he has done um, with his own words and his own positions, even if it's only to cast light on the situation that, occur, that is occurring in our territory. Hello, we've, I have lost all video link. Hi, Monica. Are you still with us? Hola, Monica. ¿Nos escuchas? Perdón. Sí, aquí sigo. Yes, I'm back. Okay. Yes, here I am. I've finished now. Okay. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, Monica. Um, it's it's such a, um, a powerful testimony that you give and I think really exposing the, the false narrative of development when clearly uh, you, you have explained so um, so well how um, the damages that it's causing to, to your community and the human rights and environmental impacts. Um, and again, I think that urge for a strong treaty is very clear. So thank you so much. Um, and now I will uh, move on to our second speaker, um, who is uh, Luisa Rodriguez who is a researcher with SINAP and whose role uh, includes accompaniment of communities in uh, La Guajira and other uh, communities in Colombia. Uh, SINAP is a Colombian Jesuit organization that has been working for over 50 years on human rights and sustainable peace in Colombia. Uh, and for the past 10 years, they've been working with the communities in La Guajira um, and with um, Afro-descendant and Campesino uh, communities. Um, so now, Luisa, I'll hand over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Siobhan. So first, I would just like to thank the Special Rapporteur again for his statement, for the video that he sent us, and for the report that he uh, he sent in favour of the rights of communities. And we're and we're very sad about the uh, Colombian uh, report about that like, statement that they made. So Monica has said uh, a lot about the situation and explained it very well in the, the current constituent, the situation they're living through and the systematic violation of their views, of, of their rights. 
that the Cerrejón uh, coal mine has been doing for the last 40 years, more than 40 years. I will say a few more things, but I think Monica has really said nearly everything. So firstly, I want to say that for years, national organizations, human rights organizations, such like uh, Via Digna, like CINEP, like Cajar and other organizations have insisted in the need for a, a binding treaty and uh, have asked the national government, the Colombian government, to participate in the sessions, the, the working group uh, for the binding treaty as an international instrument, a binding instrument to ensure the protection of human rights in the cases of transnational companies and their activities. So the, and the, we've insisted on this because of the existing uh, instruments such as the guiding principles are just voluntary, they're not binding. And by not being obligatory and the way that they're conceived, they do, they do not so they do not mean they're not a, they're not a viable uh, tool because people ignore them uh, because in the end the economy rules and so in in the in, and also in the context of Colombia with the uh, violent context and the situation of violence and human rights that ex uh, exists Monica has explained the destruction of water sources and the situation of different illnesses that they're suffering have been well documented and different abuses of human rights. There are various different risks and threats that they are subject to that um, they are constantly subject to. And this shows that the instruments that are currently available are not effective because they're not binding. And it puts the they put the human rights and the lives of the workers and the communities at risk and it's and they put it in the hands of just the will of the commu of the companies and so for many decades in colombia various different governments the, the uribe ones the different the uribe Belez, uh, uh presidency also the santos one and now and the Ivan duque They've always looked to uh, favor financial investment from the outside Colombia. And they've always gone against the protection of environmental uh, protection and the protection of human rights, despite what the, uh, as, as the um, UN rap uh, rapporteur has recognized the actual uh, legal legislation that should support it. And so, so yes, as we said, we do have an important amount of human rights legislation, but it's just on paper. And so unfortunately, the working and environmental situation in the reality is uh, completely different. So we see the power that companies have um, and how they actually violate human rights. And we see what actually happens in the reality. So. So we see the flexibilization of the government to favor uh, companies' workings. Colombia has got this paradox, is facing a paradox. So, so the, you've got threats and there are many, many cases uh, which the companies have lots and lots of money. So this means, so there's a big obstacle for the institutions because they need to comply with these rulings, such as the one with relating to the Bruno stream, which is a very important uh, water source for communities in La Guajira. And that was deviated for extraction purposes by the Cerrejón company. And so we've seen. So this is just one example. That there's the 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 companies are co-opting the government institutions because they're not even recognizing and complying with sentences from the constitution court constitutional court so also in colombia paradoxically 
we see that the companies have a bigger voice in um, policies relating to human rights than the communities themselves. So what we see is within um, when they develop these uh, policies, particip participation of communities is basically null. But they invite the whole private sector to put their opinions about what they should, what policy policymakers should do relating to human rights. When what we need is a community participation, particularly in areas where you've got um, massive areas of conflict and environmental and social conflict, such as La Guajira. So you've got uh, huge amounts of. Um, uh, involvement with the private sector, whereas about 2% is about with the communities who are actually affected by these developments. And so this causes a huge problem and relates to and, and the perpetuation of human rights issues in areas such as mining and hydroelectric projects. And so therefore it is a utterly necessary for the Colombian context to have this binding treaty to be able to affect proper change and protect the lives and the quality of life of communities such as those in La Guajira of the Afro Campesino and La Guajira La, Gua La Guayu communities there. So the impunity that reigns in Colombia which is what is obvious in La Guajira for the last 20 years Terrejón has been under the um, ruling of BHP, Anglo-American Glencore. They've had more than 14 uh, sentences in favor of the rights of the communities because they have uh, violated the rights to food, to health, to water, to uh, cultural life, to have access to their territories in all sorts of rights that have been violated and have been protected by these sentences and have condemned the company for its actions. But, but when this uh, La Guajira department has got a crisis that has been going through this humanitarian crisis that is the largest one and it's been going on for over 10 years, and it's in the constitutional court permanently. And these things could be avoidable, but the institutions do not respond to these sentences when the company fails to comply with them. And so this relate, results in utter impunity. Monica has talked about various environmental crimes and there is no justice. But on top of that, it's an ecocide, ecocide, an ethnocide that is taking place in La Guajira and also the, all of the violations of human rights that we've always talked about and they uh, still uh, fail to respond to these and this impunity continues because there is no justice in relation to all of these sentences because the institutions and all, neither the institutions or the companies respond to these legal judgments. So the company continues to die, both nationally and in different hearings, both the PHP, uh, Glencore and Anglo-American in all of their different uh, reports relating to human rights, they still refuse to take responsibility and be accountable for these things. They don't understand why the Colombian government and in this case the court The, the, ironically, they don't see it, they, they, they wonder why it's so important, like the life of the communities uh, that Monica talked about. It was from the Provincial um, Reserve, who is defending their right to a healthy environment where all of their territory has been polluted by Cerrejón activities. And so all they say is that they comply with all environmental standards, which has been found to not be true. And, to, and they comply with human rights uh, uh, requirements, which is obviously not true. And as also courts are found to not be true. So I'm running out of time, but the treaty would give us a possibility and an opportunity to protect uh, rights than, uh, to uh, the environment, to human rights and to nature. So I do hope that this session for the working group of human rights and transnational com companies can move forward with this to make sure that com companies 
and see companies like Terrejón realize that it is fundamental. So they should stop some of their activities or some of their projects if they aren't aware of the environmental impacts and social impacts that their activities are um, causing and provoking. There's, there's the Cerrejón uh, damage that it's causing but, and, and relating to the Bruno uh, tributary. So although within the Constitutional Court in Colombia, This is something that has been, yeah, and this has been um, so supported by the Constitutional Court uh, for over the last years. So this binding treaty would also represent a an opportunity, or it's a path to bet and uh, to show that you can't create these damages and these environmental damages, the social and cultural damages that it caused. It completely, uh, the, it, you can't take, you can't go back on them. It, it and you need to. And you can't continue to prioritize economic gain in uh, above the lives and well-being of communities in the environment. And so also the risk situation and the situation of threats that defenders of human rights, of water, the life and the environment face. Various human rights defenders are being killed when they uh, pro like they defend their human rights, then they defend their territory, when they defend the lives of their children, when they defend the rights of future generations, because many of the leaders in La Guajira, are, what they're doing isn't just for them, or just for the La Guajira territory, it is just for a have a, a, a life when they live in dignity and they live in harmony with nature and that to allow future generations to be able to do this. And this is so valuable. And they do that with their integrity and in the defense of their life. So, so we're moving towards that, but we must, but we must think about that. And also the important um, focus on the protection of the people who defend these rights. And we must also try to understand and Colombia and other countries, it's not just victims of the the violence relating to the in, in, internal armed conflict, but also there's the victims uh, relating to transnational company. Mon Monica has said this desarrollo, so the, the supposed progress or development, but the destruction of all of the water sources. And this is really a genocide, an, uh, an ecocide and ethnocide in La Guajira. Thank you. Thank you so much, Louisa. Um, I, uh, I mean, the level of impunity that you have outlined is just so shocking and unacceptable. Um, and I think it's so important that you have, well, named the power of companies and how they've managed to co-opt institutions, but also um, the need for communities to be central to the responses and particularly uh, central to the, the development of the UN Binding Treaty. Um, so thank you so much for your presentation um, and I'm sure there'll be lots of questions after. Um, and so uh, finally I would like to um, hand over to Connor O'Neill uh, who's the Advocacy and Policy Officer at Christian Aid Ireland who've been working with local partners in Colombia on tackling violence and building peace for over 20 years. In February Christian Aid launched new research on the Sarah Han mine, looking particularly at the role played by large multinationals and links to Ireland's uh, state-owned energy company. Um, so Connor will discuss the uh, corporate involvement and key lessons for an effective binding treaty. Uh, so thank you, Connor. Thanks, Siobhan. Um, hi, everybody. I'm really, really glad to be part of the discussion today. And as as Siobhan said, we in Christian Aid have been working with our partners in Colombia um, for over 20 years and recently in particular in trying to challenge the injustices at Sarajan and the shocking human rights abuses described by Monica, uh, Louisa and the Special Rapporteur who I'm privileged to share a panel with 
for us, the, the Sarah Hunt case is a perfect alarming example of the role that large corporate actors can play in fueling human rights abuses. But importantly, it also highlights the role and in many respects, the failure of states when you consider the, the lack of regulation and accountability that's been described. And I want to talk a little bit about that international side of things and the lessons we can take for the treaty. First of all, I think, look at the reason that this is happening, the coal. Sarah Hohn produces around 25 to 30 million tonnes per year. It's about 2.5% uh, of the world's market. And over a quarter of that goes to European countries who've traditionally been the biggest buyers, although that's fallen in recent years as the continent tries to move away from uh, polluting fossil fuels. In Ireland, over the past two decades, our state-owned energy company, the ESB, has purchased millions of tonnes of this coal. And this is despite years of well-documented accounts of injustices carried out to produce it in the first place. The, the displacement, the environmental destruction, the intimidation of activists, um, and it has failed to adequately account for the human rights abuses taking place along its supply chain. And instead, it's relied on a, a flawed buyer-funded assessment initiative, which has been strongly criticized by civil society and by the affected communities as unfit for purpose. And this matters because while the international standards we have set at OECD level and indeed at UN level make it clear that companies must take action to, to identify, mitigate, prevent, and indeed to remedy uh, human rights abuses along their supply chains, those rules are not legally binding. Companies can ignore them or engage with them ineffectively. Even if they're a 95% owned by a state which has strongly endorsed those rules and the human rights principles contained in them. So for countries like Ireland, there's a real contradiction here. The government has played a very active role in promoting peace and human rights in Colombia, but by failing to ensure that Irish and indeed state-owned companies are not contributing to abuses, it seriously risks undermining those efforts. We, we should also consider how Sarah Hone operates and who profits. So remember that it's owned by three international mining giants, BHP, Anglo-American and Glencore, but its sales are actually managed through a small subsidiary, the coal marketing company, uh, CMC, which is domiciled in Dublin. And this is important and it might sound familiar. Ireland's corporate tax rate of 12.5%, the third lowest rate in the OECD, as well as extensive tax relief that can push that figure even lower, have made it a magnet for these kinds of multinationals. By, by basing a subsidiary in Dublin, companies like CMC, who in 2018 booked almost 3 billion US dollars of revenue, can significantly reduce their tax bills. This means that in effect, not only does much of the coal go abroad, but some of the profit does too. And this is, this is an elephant in the room when we talk about corporate impact on human rights. Tax avoidance is devastating. It, it undermines states' capacity to raise revenue, fund essential public services like housing and healthcare, and to realize people's rights, especially economic, social, and cultural rights. So when, when we look at this treaty and we talk about harmful corporate activity, when we consider things like dangerous working conditions or environmental destruction, let us make sure that corporate tax avoidance is high up on that list of activities too. Um, what, what can this tell us then about the need for a treaty? Well, if you consider corporate structures like this, the ownership of the mine, the scale of the money involved, the, uh, the lack of real accountability, you see the absence of global rules that this treaty is supposed to address. And it's, it's not hard to see why it's been so difficult for the affected communities to seek justice, to, to hold to account three parent companies who were spread across the UK, Switzerland and Australia, with huge budgets and huge legal teams, operating through another subsidi subsidiary domiciled in Ireland. And Sarah Hone really shows the, the real core need for a UN binding treaty. The, the global economy has rapidly changed, but the rules just have not kept pace. Situations like this are now commonplace with, with complex corporate structures and long supply chains. And in reality, fragmented sets of national rules just haven't been able to regulate this activity properly. And in, in the cracks between those national rules, injustice takes root and it starts to grow. And we see the kind of abuses described in particular by Monica. Um, 
So what, what we can do, I think, is try and learn from this to draw lessons for an effective transformative treaty to end corporate impunity. And I, I want to close with, with five key principles that we can see from this case. Firstly, the treaty must protect people and planet. There's been talk this week about the, the scope of the treaty, what rights it will protect. Serahone shows us that it needs to be broad, covering all human rights, but also environmental rights and those related to the enjoyment of a safe, clean and healthy environment. The damage caused in this case is not just things like displacement, but also pollution and ecological destruction. And the remedies sought include restoration of the land, air and water resources. And in fact, in this case, we see that the distinction that's drawn between community and environment is abstract. In, in reality, those two things are closely interdependent. Second, it needs to set clear legally binding obligations for business. It should establish a corporate duty to respect human rights and the environment and require companies to do their proper adequate due diligence checks right along their supply chains. It's not enough to say, well, look, we only buy the coal or that the conditions of people who make the clothes we sell are not our concern. Thankfully, we have rejected that argument in the, the global normative framework of the UN guiding principles. But now we need to see those principles reflected in binding rules for them to be effective. Thirdly, um, and the special rapporteur closed with this, the treaty needs to have teeth. It has to require states to establish clear systems of administrative, civil, and criminal liability for corporate human rights abuses. Mandating um, due diligence checks is not enough and it can't absolve a company, a company that's involved in an abuse. And this is hugely important. If, if corporate actors know that they will be faced with serious penalties, then they'll be slower to, to abuse human rights in the way that's been described. Fourth, um, the treaty needs to ensure real meaningful access to justice. The, the purpose in the, in the first instance is to try and address the imbalance between powerful corporate actors on one hand and affected communities on the other. And Sarah Hohen shows us how extraordinarily difficult it is to hold TNCs to account. And the treaty needs to make this possible. So lower barriers to justice, provide legal aid, enable communities to submit complaints either through representatives or collectively in the forums and the courts that are actually most accessible to them. Um, in situations where information is hidden, compel companies to disclose it and crucially provide for meaningful remedy, including financial compensation and environmental restoration where appropriate. And fifth and finally, um, the treaty has to center the experiences of affected communities and human rights defenders. In, in doing so, it should, it should recognize the disproportionate impact on women who often have less formal rights to land, are overrepresented in precarious work, and I would look to the outstanding feminist analysis of the current treaty that's been published in the last couple of weeks. Um, because ultimately, I think if we, dis if we consider the abuses that were described today that everyone here is familiar with, and we're not able to say that the treaty will address them, then it won't have done its job. The ultimate benchmark that it has to be assessed against is the testimony of the affected communities, the descriptions that um, Monica gave and I would, I would urge all the states present this week and indeed attending this event to listen to them and to, to take that into account and engage to make sure we get a, a treaty that's really fit for purpose. Thank you. Thank you so much, Connor. Um, and I think it's, yeah, it's so important, the points you've made, particularly the, the global interlinkages the um, and making the point about tax avoidance and the impact of that, but also the need for kind of policy coherence um, uh, and uh, ensuring that our, our states are ensuring human rights are protected um, in their actions also. Um, and I think, you know, it's really important as well, um, you know, to talk about what's needed in the treaty, but also what's needed from member states. And I think uh, certainly from civil society in Europe, we're very disappointed this week that the EU is uh, here for the sixth year without a negotiation mandate um, and is inputting into the session um, through questions and clarifications and not through substantive inputs as other states are doing. Um, and I think it's really important that, that this, this stance changes. Um, so I will 
we'll, I think we have uh, uh, five minutes for questions. Um, so perhaps if the panelists, if you could turn on your cameras, I think that would be helpful. And um, I'm just going to, we might try and see how many we can get through. Um, we have um, a question, so you, you can take, I mean, like there's some that have been directed towards people. So for Monica, there's a question about, um, have human rights activists been harmed uh, in, in La Guajira in the context of the, the Sarah Hun mine? Um, and also um, a question about the impact of COVID-19. Um, and um, there's also a question which I think Louisa or Monica might address, which is um, why is the state not implementing the, the court decisions? Uh, so why is Colombia not implementing the, its own court decisions? Um, and then one, two, think directed towards Connor. Uh, one around is the ESB still buying coal, and have the government um, made any statement on this, uh, or or the company? Um, and I think that's all. So hopefully, um, I'm sorry, I have a cat who's very uh, interested in the binding treaty, um, who won't, <laughs> is getting on the screen. But um, perhaps uh, if we could go first to Monica. Um, and maybe just very briefly before the session ends, if you if we if you could uh, answer those questions, and then we'll go to Louisa and then to Rodrigo or to uh, Connor. If if Monica. La pregunta, por favor. Perfect. Can you repeat the question, please? Yes. Um, so, Monica, uh, the question was around: Have human rights defenders been harmed in the context of the Serahan operations? Um, and also, is there a particular, in the time of COVID, has that, um, what has been the impact of the pandemic? Can you, can you hear us, Monica? Yeah, perfect. Yes, I can hear. Thank you. Okay, yes. So we have been attacked by the c company. So there are very clear examples. So the Nulida action in which the company incited the workers to, to say that it was our fault. The, it was our fault that the mine was going to close. So they're inciting violence from the workers against us. So this generated uh, so they were trying to put the communities, uh, communities against us and the workers against us as the community. So this is a very clear way in, way in which the mine, oh, sorry. Oh. Yeah, uses its workers and uses the workers to uh, pit them against social leaders and human rights defenders. And not just that. Mm. So, so we get attacked for defending a life, water, our territory. And so we get these threats and threats come as a result of us defending these human rights. Oh, sorry, Monica's cutting out now. I'm not sure if it's just me. So this struggle is the only one that we have. I mean, this is our essence. And so this is at the root of, uh, of, of the cases that we're taking forward because so also during the pandemic, there was reportedly a decree that was issued by the Colombian government to stop mining activity during the uh, quarantine or during a, a month or so, something like that, but that didn't happen. The company continued to operate throughout all this time, throughout the lockdown and continues to, whilst the pandemic continues, which and the Colombian government should force the company to stop because during the pandemic, the communities uh, are paying for paying the price of them stopping. So, but that what they do is they attack us. 
So the reports and the, 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 when we take things to the courts, when we say this, when we're, we're uncovering what the company really is. And they didn't stop during the pandemic and they attack us for that. Thank you, Monica. Yes, and I think it's such a, um, a a very similar story for human rights defenders, where the pandemic has heightened the uh, the attacks, and of course, then mining being designated an essential business within that context is so problematic. Um, and Louisa, um, um, perhaps if if you could address the question, um, just to the last two <laughs> speakers, we've we're I think we've got about three minutes. So if you could just maybe very succinctly give your your view, Louisa, on why the the, the Colombian courts have not in, uh, implemented the resolutions or the the judgments. Thank you. Uh, sí, voy a yes. I'll be very quick. It's not that the it's not that the courts don't implement it. So yeah, they, the 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 rulings come from the court. But we've got three different issues that we talked about. So we've got there's corporate capture, and it's very high in the, uh, in Colombia. The the companies have caught uh, like have, have, have co-opted all of the institutions because of the importance and the economic power of these companies institutionally in Colombia. So is very unstable. So this is both on a regional level and also on a national level. And this and this this weakness in the institutions is taken advantage of by companies such as Terrejon. And so also when they're working in uh, various Afro and indigenous communities, it's not considered something that's very important. So the Colombian government don't understand that so they're all yeah they don't they, they they see progress as a different thing they don't see progress as uh, something of importance to protect uh, community and communities rights and the self -deter -ter determination and self-governance they do not respect these things this has not been respected not only in la guajira but also in uh, the sierra nevada santa marta communities it has also been um this has been ignored. They've got a protection for their territory rulings and the state refuses to uh, recognize the implementation of that there as well. And they also ignore rulings that have been ruled in favor of these communities. Thank you, Louisa. And actually, I think it's so important that you've pointed to the um, the, 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 the issues around indigenous people's rights as well. And as Connor, you mentioned the gender issues i think the intersections of patriarchy with racism are so important to this discussion as well um uh, so connor maybe if you could finally <laughs> very quickly address the questions do you, do you have them there or can you yeah yeah, yeah I, I have and um, yeah just to be very quick as i'm conscious of the time um as regards esb the latest figures and latest statements are that it hasn't imported coal from the mine since 2018 after millions of tons in the in the two preceding decades but it's also failed to publicly confirm that it will no longer do so and recognize the the human rights abuses as opposed to just a normal rise and fall based on demand so we've been trying to engage with them and calling on them to clarify that and to make sure that it it will sever its commercial relationship with the mine based on the abuses that have been described as regards the irish government's response i think it's important to acknowledge that the government has engaged with the Colombian authorities in relation to attacks on human rights defenders to express this concern, which is important. Um, on the other hand, the response as regards ESB and its commercial relationship with the mine has been disappointing, which it is essentially referred to a statement made by Better Coal, which, as I mentioned briefly, is an, an industry funded um, non transparent assessment initiative that's been roundly condemned by civil society, but also by the affected communities, crucially, as greenwashing and not really fit for purpose. So it, it's pretty clear that this, this isn't enough um, to be compliant with the, the OECD's framework or indeed the UN guiding principles. So what, what we've been doing in Christian Aid, um, we're a founding member of the Irish Coalition for Business and Human Rights, along with TROCRA, the Irish Congress of Trade Unions, Oxfam, and a lot of other civil society organizations based here. And we're, we've been engaging with the Irish government to ask them essentially to try and do two things. First of all, push for a, an effective binding UN treaty. 
but secondly to to bring in uh, new rules and regulation domestic levels to make sure that um companies won't be able to engage in behavior like this and crucially that those rules have teeth and are binding they're not just voluntary principles and that's what we'll be working on and we'll appreciate the the support of anyone attending the the webinar today thank you so much connor yeah and a, a last comment Muchas from Perdona. So I just wanted to say from different Colombian organizations in Colombia, Bastia Cerrejón, which is a solidarity movement uh, for people in La Guajira in Colombia, is a way to work against and to protect communities against transnational communities, both in La Guajara, in uh, the community of Santa Marta that I mentioned before. It's an opportunity to strengthen these um, activities and these uh, defense of human rights in uh, campesino, indigenous and Afro communities in Colombia, in Colombia, Latin America and through the whole world. Thank you, Luisa. Um, and, um, uh, we will uh, perhaps share the, the actions again that we would like uh, everybody to take, um, which I think can be put up on the screen. Um, so just to finish off, um, thank you so much to all our panelists. That was such an interesting discussion, so insightful. Um, and yeah, I think it's very clear. We know that the key messages coming actually through the thread of your three presentations were the need for accountability, to listen to communities, to make sure communities and human rights defenders are at the heart of everything we do. Um, and we need a treaty with teeth. Um, so please take action as per the, the slide today um, and, um, and send a clear message to our member states that we need them at the table and we need them shaping this very important treaty. Uh, thank you so much everybody for your attendance. Um, thank you very much. Goodbye. Muchísimas gracias a todos. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Thank you. Gracias, Simon. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Luisa. And Monica. Thank you. I can see you're still online. And Connor. Gracias a ustedes por permitirnos eh, estar. Eh, well, thank you for letting for us be here in this space to share and to to be able to talk about our experiences, our daily our daily lives, and what's been going on.